Good morning, Chair. Our witness today is Mr. David Smith. Before we um, hear from Mr. Smith, um, I'd like to make an announcement about what I anticipate is going to happen today. Um, as you will know, uh, the Prime Minister has made a request that as many of us as possible observe a minute silence at 11 a.m. this morning. I propose to observe that minute silence by remaining silent on the screen. Um, I understand that some people may wish not to observe that silence or may wish to observe it in private. And accordingly, shortly before 11 o'clock, we'll stop the proceedings. Those who wish to leave the inquiry room are, of course, free to do so. And those who wish to join from other parts of the inquiry team who are not in the room can come into the room if they wish to do so. And then at 11 o'clock, those of us who are in the inquiry room, either in person or remotely, will observe the minute silence. Following that, we'll have our morning break till 11.15. And then because this is all happening a little earlier than usual, we'll probably take an early lunch and aim to complete our business by about three o'clock by these rather different means, Ms. Kennedy. So I hope everyone understands that. And if you think that I'm um, getting too close to 11 o'clock before adjourning, just stop me, all right, Ms. Kennedy? Yes, we'll do so. Thank you. Um, Mr. David Smith. If you trust me, I do solemnly, sincerely and truly. I do solemnly, sincerely and truly. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Mr Smith, you've given two witness statements to the inquiry, one in respect of phase two and one in respect of phase three. Do you have the first witness statement in front of you? I do indeed. Um, and it should run to 24 pages. And if you turn to the 24th page, is that your signature there? Yes, it is. And it's dated the 30th of August 2022? It is indeed. Have you read through it recently? Yes, I have. Is it true to the best of your knowledge? It is. Turning then to your second statement, do you also have that there? I do. Um, and that should run to 16 pages. And if you turn to the 16th page, is that your signature there? It's actually on the 17th it's page, the 17th. but it is indeed. Oh, it finishes on the 16th, and this yes. finishes on the 17th. And it's dated the 7th of February 2020. It is, it is, yes. Have you read through this statement recently? I have, yes. And is it also true to the best of your knowledge? Yes, it is. Those witness statements are now in evidence. Everything I ask you is supplementary. And can I start by saying thank you very much for coming to give evidence to the inquiry today. Starting with some questions about your background, can you explain what you did before you joined the post office? Uh, I worked at uh, British Airways in, uh, well, I started actually at British European Airways and uh, I worked in finance, first of all, as, a, as an auditor. Um, and then various roles in uh, root uh, accounting. Um, I worked on, um, I worked on um, the privatisation of BA at one stage, um, and I was um, also the financial controller of British Airways helicopters. Um, I was actually sent in there to assist the managing director in selling the company. And, um, we worked through that and uh, sold the company. And um, one of the uh, one of the terms of the contract was that uh, British Airways severance terms were available to me, which I which I took. And after that, I joined the post office. And that was in 1987. That's correct. Yes. What was your first job in the post office? I was uh, chief financial accountant. Um, it was uh, a fairly broad role, actually, because it involved not just what you'd expect a financial accountant to do, but it also involved running the factory in Chesterfield. Some uh, around 800 odd people uh, involved in uh, the back office work associated with um, office accounting and client settlement, uh, sub postmasters remuneration, uh, various business processes. 
And then in July 1996, you were appointed as Director of Central Services Group. Yeah, this was... <laughs> I retained my, my role as uh, Head of the Finance Executive um, whilst doing that. The, it, it was an odd role because my, um, my, I was charged with breaking up that directorate and basically attaching the various uh, uh, sections within it to other parts of the organisation. So it was a, a short-term role that lasted like, about six to nine months. Um, and uh, then I was, the plan was that I was going to revert uh, full-time to head of finance executive. But what happened then? Well, I was, <laughs> I, I was approached by uh, not one, but th I think three directors in, in total. Uh, I wasn't told I was going to be uh, heading up automation transformation, uh, but I was asked whether I would uh, consider it. Um, I mean, I'd spent over 25 years building a career in finance, so um, I guess I went through some kind of grieving cycle. Um, but I mean, I came to terms with it, and uh, you know, there started my long association with uh, automation projects. And why were you initially reluctant to take up that role? Well, I think part of the reluctance was it just wasn't. I mean, it came. It was not a job I, I uh, sought. Um, and my initial reluctance was this, this was a lot to take on board. Um, as I got to accepting that this was going to happen, I, I did, um, I did with, with Stuart Sweetman challenge him about where the authority came to carry out this role. Because none of the projects, none of the business activities uh, to deliver automation would report directly to me. In fact, many of them reported directly to directors. So how did I, where, where, where would I draw the authority from to get these people to um, do what I needed them to do, um, which is to work very closely together? Um, Stuart did take that away. Um, he, he wasn't the first to announce the outcome of that. Uh, I, I bumped into our marketing director actually walking along the street, and uh, he sort of bowed down to me and said, well, I understand now, Dave, that uh, I'm going to have to do as you tell me. Um, and and uh, fair enough to Stuart. I think I did have the um, authority to, um, in particular, when a big issue arose, to pull the parties together very rapidly to seek a resolution. Um, Things didn't normally happen that quickly in the post office. It might take you uh, two or three weeks, if you're lucky, two or three months, uh, if you weren't lucky to, to get the right people together. Did you have any qualifications or experience in information technology at that point? Uh, yeah, well, starting from my, my university days, I, I, I'd done some ASA Fortran, uh, basic, um, at the, um, as, as an auditor. I, I hesitate to call myself a computer auditor. But, but I did start to audit through the system, or through systems rather than just around them. And uh, I would um, review system-based controls and then test them with test packs and what have you. At helicopters, uh, substantial control of systems was part of my responsibility. When I joined the post office, all the, all the major systems were actually supporting the areas that I controlled. So I was the business's major customer of systems, which meant that I engaged with um, the, the systems people on a regular basis. Uh, when I moved to uh, the finance executive, I led um, an SAP project called Microsap. Um, unusually, we delivered ahead of time within budget, and the benefits were somewhat um, greater than we forecast in, in, in the business case. Uh, so I think I'd had, had a fair amount of uh, exposure to, to systems and involvement in, in systems project work. And you said you were associated with the Horizon system from then until you left in yes. March 2010, is that right? That's correct, yes. And just for clarity, shortly after you left, another David Smith took over as managing director, <laughs> yes, is that right? Yes, yes. There were rather a few of us, and uh, matters were complicated by the fact that neither of us were given uh, a second Christian name, so... Uh, I became known as David X, and he became known as David Y. Uh, but uh, there was confusion over time. We'd get each other's mail and uh, what have you, and there's, there's some of the documents I've received were, in fact, meant for him. Um, and between 1997 and 2010, 
you held a number of other roles. In 2004, you became acting IT director when Alan Barry went to the Royal Mail. That's, that's correct, yes. And then in February 20, 2005, you became general manager of IT, which then changed to head of change in IS. Is yes. That right? I mean, post office used to go through regular reorganisations and, um, and, you know, roles would be uh, changed, not always uh, significantly, uh, but, yeah, job title. I mean, essentially, I think the difference between being general manager IT and head of change in IS uh, was that uh, I, I gained a much broader range of change in the business. Um, I think it was over a thousand changes a year we used to to deliver. Many of them uh, seemingly quite minor changes, but if you got them wrong, could create massive disruption. So the change in in postage stamps, for example, uh, was was quite a significant operation and had to be project managed. And then in 2009, you were operations director until you left. Yes, that, that was a, uh, just for three months. That, not, not until I left. No, that was a holding uh, situation. Uh, Rick Francis uh, left uh, Post Office Limited, and uh, Mike Young joined. And in the, the three months in between, I just held the uh, held the ring. Um, Turning then to some questions about prior to the introduction of Horizon, if we could turn up your witness statement, your first witness statement, it's WITN 05290100. And if we could turn to page seven in that. And looking at paragraph 18, um, you set out there the basis of the cash account and describe the process um, that a 200-strong group of individuals in Chesterfield would go through. Um, and you describe a separate unit just to deal with pensions and allowances that was even larger in size and a third group processing postal orders and about 80 strong. There was also a unit in Edinburgh mirroring the Chesterfield operation dealing with Scottish branches. And if we scroll down to paragraph 20, you set out that over 5,000 errors per week were detected and that many of these would result in an issue of an error notice. Um, did you feel that was a lot of errors at that time under the paper-based approach? Um, it sure as hell felt like it. Um, I guess there's no... no. I mean, I'd, I'd never in my working career come across something that was so paper-based. Um, I think it would be fair to say that... Uh, the um, that the airline that I joined, the use of accounting systems, uh, was uh, about 15, 20 years ahead of where the post office was. So I'd never come across a, a paper factory uh, like this. I mean, I think I said it in the the, the, the uh, further on in the statement that there was a dedicated freight train just to bring the pensions and allowances paper into uh, Chesterfield. If you understand the cash account process, if you, you go through what's involved in putting the cash account together, um, you know, it's a very, very complicated process. Uh, and it's not surprising, therefore, that you, you got the level of errors that, 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 that we had. We tried all the while to drive them down, but also... Um, the counter was a place of constant change. So uh, as soon as you dampen down errors in one area, there'd be a change to other products and um, you know, a new source of error would arise in, in, in another. Um, and if we could turn over the page on that statement to paragraph 24, scrolling down, you say there the 5,000 plus errors yeah. mentioned was merely the tip of the iceberg. Did you find that a very difficult environment in which to work? Um, I mean, the, the, what I was getting in 24. I mean, when I when I joined, one of my one of my objectives was to take 200 posts out of Chesterfield, and um, you know, in most processes, in most businesses, uh, the way to do that is to either radically reform the process or to take out waste, and. Um, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these errors were related to conformance. So, for example, uh, this freight train that came in um, each week, the uh, pouches uh, were meant to be made up to a particular standard, 
they very often weren't. And we ran a trial with uh, the Derby District uh, and the, the Plain English Society, developed a, a, a refreshed set of instructions and uh, just to get the, um, you know, conformance with the presentation standards that we required. Um, on the basis of the, the, the pilot in Derby, we rolled it out nationally, targeting 17 posts coming out just from, you know, people not putting paper clips, uh, staples, uh, segmenting the different uh, classifications of benefits uh, properly. Uh, and so a lot of this was, was, was about that sort of stuff. So my, my interest was to, um, you know, drive out these areas of, of, of error and drive the resources down. Um, and you mentioned the pensions and allowances in the freight train. If we turn back over the page to paragraph 21 and down. Sorry, and on to the next page again. You say there that that area was particularly prone to fraud. Yes. Can you explain what you mean by that? Well, it was the, the checks here, such was the, the, the volume of, um, of, of paper that it was not possible to run a 100% check uh, every week on the, so so basically these these checks involved summation of the individual vouchers to a summary docket onto the cash account and um, basically we're saying that you know the check was was only done uh, I, th I think every couple of years or something like that um, at the time I joined, there was one fraud that was being settled of £400,000. And what some postmasters would do would just enter uh, an erroneous number onto the cash account, one that was deliberately erroneous. And, uh, and, and effectively, the cash would then... So they, they, they would be funded by the false amount that they put on the, the, the cash account, and they would pocket the, the, the money. Uh, and again, I remember a few, a f very short period of time into my service with the post office, there was a case of a sub-postmaster who had um, fraudulently entered entries onto the cash account to the tune of £85,000. And uh, the reason why it sticks is that when security went in and, and, and apprehended him, he wrote a check out there and then on the spot, and it didn't bounce. Um, so this was this was um, this was a result of uh, you know a poorly designed process, really. I mean, in a um, horizon itself was you know kicked off by the benefits agency wanting to. Uh, attack fraud at all sorts of different levels, mainly on, on, on their side, in entitlement uh, fraud. This was sort of encashment fraud involving sub-postmasters. How prevalent was this type of fraud, would you say? Or what was your impression? Um, I, I'm sorry, I, 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 I would have known at the time, but I can't remember now. I mean, I, I remember those two big instances because they were, you know, even in those days, large sums of money, but I, I can't recall, I'm afraid. But you felt it was a real problem? Oh, time. it was a real problem, yeah. And did you expect Horizon, when it came in, to catch these people out or to leave no room for them to hide? Um, well, had Horizon come in as it originally was intended, then this would have closed that, that, that down because um, it would have been card-driven. And... Um, you know, there's, there's no, there would have been no question of the sub-postmaster creating a, a false entry on the cash account. Uh, as, it was, as it was actually introduced when the system went live, there was simply a, uh, uh, a check that this was a valid uh, book of, of, of vouchers that the sub-postmaster was, uh, was using. Um, it was obviously subsequently... Um, replaced by a, a dedicated post office uh, card account, which closed this, this area down. Um, you mentioned in your statement that you stepped in on EPOS during the process of the development of the programme, the electronic point of sale system. Um, if we could turn up your first statement, that's WITN 0529010 again, and page 13.
and scrolling down, please, to paragraph 41. You say, I was asked to describe the nature of the work I carried out in relation yeah. to EPOS design. I must reiterate that I did not manage Horizon and it was not normally, it was normally for Horizon management team to step, a team to manage the project issues and risks. I did, however, step in on this issue. Um, why did you step in on that issue? Well, there was, there was a lot of concern about, um, about what was being developed. I mean, this was, th th this in part, I think, came about because of the, the PF, PFI deal. So there was limited to, to zero exposure to what was actually being developed. Um, and um, we were, I mean, Darren being able to get in there and access what he did access was something of a surprise. I think it was uh, considered, you know, very much against expectation at, at, at the time. Unfortunately, um, unfortunately, Darren's presentation uh, doesn't exist. So I'm g going a lot on memory here about what he he, he brought to uh, the, the table. Um, I can't say that uh, his presentation. Uh, uh, in any way calmed the, the, the concerns around the, um, uh, what was being uh, developed at all. Um, but uh, we, without, I, I don't think we've even got the, uh, I'd even seen the ATSD minutes uh, for the meeting at which he presented that, um, that feedback. Um, if we could turn up POL 00028324, please. Um, this is the automation transformation program, um, and we can see there that um, you're on the list for this automation transformation steering group, and this is the notes, notes of a meeting of the 23rd of June 1998. And if we scroll on to the second page, please, we see the red light issues there, um, and you are giving a verbal update on new issues. And if we scroll down, we can see EPOS is something that's on that list. And scrolling down again, there's also item four recorded as um, you there as giving an update on the work on the EPOS design. Um, the inquiries heard a lot of evidence about the EPOS system, but this was specifically something that was acutely on your mind, is that right? Yes, it, it would have been to have been raised in, in, in this fashion, yes. And if we could turn to POL 00028484, please. Um, this is a risk register, I think, from 1997, 1998. Um, but if we look at the fourth section down, operational non-conformance to business procedures in automated environment, and we can see potential impact for automation. Trans yes, thank you very much. Um, it says lost transactions, inability to operate effectively, loss of control, financial loss, increased errors, and that it's being discussed with the strategy director and you're the owner of that. What does it mean that you're the owner of that? You're keeping it under review. Um, yes, yes, it would, in, in, in terms of a risk register, absolutely. Um, lost transactions is a very, very serious issue, isn't it? Yes, it would be, yes. And do you remember being particularly concerned about that at this time? I, I, I don't know, I'm sorry. Um, I mean, the fact that I, I'd recorded it there obviously says it was a concern. Uh, but, I, I mean, I don't remember much uh, about the specifics, of, you know, behind that. Um, turning forward in time slightly to the 18th of November 1999, if we could turn to POL 00028550, please. Thank you. And we can see there that this is a negotiation brief written by Keith Baines, um, for David Miller, and it's sent to both David Miller and to you. Um, and if we scroll over the page, we can see the start of that brief. Um, the point I wanted to take you to in particular is uh, page three. And if we scroll down to paragraph 11, it records... The third area was the reduction in errors in accounting data passed from your systems into TIP and the development of appropriate integrity controls for that interface. 
progress in this area has not been encouraging. The overall level of errors has greatly exceeded the 0.6% target level by an order of magnitude or more. Other criteria have, not, have also not been met. Analysis of the causes of new incidents has not met the 10-day turnaround target. Um, and going down to 12, we also have some concerns about progress with the new integrity control. While Pathway have been reporting satisfactory progress against plans, our people on the ground perceive that there has been a reversion to old ways of working with the shutters being brought down. We have seen no progress on development of the joint processes that will be needed to manage the errors trapped by the control. And on this, and on the specification of interface processes, we have found Pathway unwilling to engage in meaningful discussions. So at this point in time, data integrity is a real concern, and there's a worry, isn't there, that Pathway aren't, aren't giving you the access that you wanted? Absolutely, yeah. Um, and I'm not going to turn up the second supplementary agreement, but it's fair to say the target level in terms of errors was 0.6 target level that's yeah. recorded there. But at this stage, errors were exceeding that. Yes, I... Um one of the, I think, Rule 10 documents I was given uh, does actually uh, contain the, uh, the actual percentage uh, levels week by, by week. And, uh, I mean, many orders of magnitude greater than 0 0.6. Yeah. Um, if we could turn up POL 00028545, please. Um, and this is a speaking brief for you um, on the 24th of November 1999. And it sets out the purpose was agreed between Dave Miller and Richard Christouas to agree a programme of work to be completed by the 3rd of December 1999, which will provide Pockel with further information to enable us to decide whether or not to exercise the right to suspend rollout. Do you remember this, this meeting or this, the reason for this speaking brief other than what's said out there? I mean, I don't remember it, but the, um, the, the brief is in front of me, and uh, <laughs> that's what I will have spoken to. And if we look, turn down to paragraph two, or number two, it says, all criteria in the second supplementary agreement to be met by 14th of January. Um, the only change to be the exclusion of the period to date from the 0.6% criterion for the accounting integrity incidents. Um, so again, you're flagging that that is of real concern to the post yeah. office at that time. Is yeah. that right? Absolutely. It was. It, it, it has still got some way to go in terms of proving that uh, Fujitsu were getting on top of it. And if we turn to POL 00028440. This is the internal audit. If we turn to page two. November to December 1999, and scrolling down, we can see your name there. Um, and if we turn over the page to page five, please, and scrolling down, we can see that the conclusions of that audit, which in short was that their opinion was that the procedures for identifying problems and reporting performance was good. We have recorded in detail, in the detailed audit findings, the issues identified during our visits and confirmed that all the issues reported by post office and transaction processing have been formally recorded as problems. Um, I believe this, when it talks about our conclusions, this is Chris Painter and Ian Johnson, is that right? Uh, it was certainly Chris Painter. Um, because I think his name's on the, the, the report. And if we could turn over the page again to page seven, and scrolling down, we see here again that the volume of errors generated by Horizon officers was a cause for concern. Initially, Horizon officers generated twice as many errors as manual officers. That must have been very difficult for you, given how you felt there were already so many issues on the paper-based system and this seems to be making it worse. Do you remember finding this frustrating at the time? Um, not particularly, no. Um, I, I think um, 
I, I think that there was a poor understanding of the soft change elements of introducing a completely different system. Um, there's a, 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 a document, um, a research services document that um, introduces something called the coping curve, which, which demonstrates that um, over time, uh, performance in branches return to pre-horizon introduction levels. Um, I think I think that that should have been better understood, that that we would go through uh, that learning curve when the system was 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 introduced, but I mean, at the time we weren't aware of that. Uh, I mean, the, at this stage, handling the errors, you know, was not my personal responsibility. Uh, therefore, I wouldn't have had the same level of concern if I was still running the factory. If I'd been running the factory, I would have been very very concerned about that ahead of uh, a, a national rollout because that would have swamped the unit. But as I, say, I think there could have been a better understanding of um, you know, how this, this process of, of introduction of people becoming as familiar with a new system as they were with the, the, the old system, how that transition worked and the, the, the journey that people went through. Um. Did you know about an EPOS task force report written within Pathway um, around the summer of 2000? No, I, I, I don't recall it, no. Um, do you recall being told that there had been a decision um, that the EPOS system wouldn't be rewritten, but it would be fixed? Do you recall being told anything about that? No, I don't, I don't recall that. Um, I mean, I do recall, um, I, I refer you back to the what I recall of the Darren and Bosco report. I mean, one of the things he specifically addressed is that, you know, the, the inherent weaknesses in, in what had been designed, you know, couldn't be, you could, you could put plaster over them, but what, if you really wanted to put something different in place, then you had to start again. Um, and when it came to Rolight, of the system, your your view was that Horizon was fit for purpose, and that was partly because of the rigorous testing process that took place. It, it, it was, yes. Did you have any concerns at the rollout stage lurking in your mind that you felt there were things you should look out for? Um, we went through um, we went through a very very extensive process of, of trying to pick out from the um, from the live trial the things that needed to be fixed. And it's fair to say there were things that required to be fixed that went beyond the, the issues that had been surfaced in this in, in inquiry. Um, we, 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 we put in place quite a comprehensive set of, set of measures. Um, in the business at the time, there was a, a complete disbelief that rollout could actually, could actually happen. Um, and... Um, I mean, it went, um, it went relatively smoothly. Uh, not to say, I mean, you know, when you look at the number of offices, the number of people uh, concerned, even if you're hitting, you know, 90% satisfaction, um, that's still a lot of people who, you know, have got issues with the way you're, 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 you're doing things. And uh, to the extent that we could, we, we tried to address those issues. But, I mean, we did... The, the process did make, in terms of the reaction of the network to it, significant strides from uh, what was, you know, a pretty, pretty, you know, poor performance. I think in in, in the live trial. I mean, fifty percent of people satisfied with the way you've done it is, is a bad result in in anybody's in anybody's book. Um, do you remember? Fast forwarding in time, do you remember the impact program that had its inception, I think, in 2003 and was completed in 2005? Yeah. Yes, I do. Were you involved in that program? Um, yes, I mean, involved uh, at various stages because I think it had as um, it, its birth was really uh, work that we did as part of the transformation management team. Um, the, the business case for, for Original Horizon was, it was the least worst option business case. 
I mean, it was not a business case that you take to a bank expecting to get funding. Um, so one of, one of the things that I was asked to do was to look at the proposition of automation and um, understand how we could get value out of, out of automating post offices. And uh, there was, there was uh, a, a program called ERA that emerged uh, out of that. Um, a lot of work was put into that. And uh, the impact program was, was an element of that. Um, it, was, it was driven, it was enabled, if you like, by automating the products, uh, by you know, bringing, uh, bringing into the modern world uh, things like the issue of driving licenses uh, and stuff like that, so that you were capturing transactions often driven by, by tokens and stuff like that. And this enabled uh, this, this radical change in, in, in the impact program to, to, to happen. So from that very early stage, it was developed. And we, we developed a roadmap of um, how, the, the, how automation was going to happen through these releases, S50 to, to S90. And um, uh, some of that was driven by, um, the order of some of those things were driven by contractual matters. So as part of um, as part of the benefits agency withdrawing from Legacy Horizon, it was set down that there would be a post office card account. Uh, it was also uh, part of that uh, that we were, uh, we had to meet the target for the introduction of pin pads and stuff like that. So there were some fixed points around which the rest of it had to work. So impact was, was positioned at, at, at S80. Was part of the objective of the impact program cost saving? Making things simpler and safer. Um, I think with, with, with all, um, I think it was a better system because um, what the what the the old system was doing was settling with clients based on summarised numbers on on cash accounts. What lay behind impact, if you like, was it was based upon where you passed a stream of transactions to uh, clients and settled on the value of those, those, those transactions. Uh, yes, it did, I think, you know, drive some, some, some numbers down, but the real value in all the automation that happened was uh, very often derived by the people who owned the products. Remember, most of what was transacted across the post office counter were products that didn't belong to the post office. You know, the exception to that was, was, was postal orders. So a lot of benefits were derived uh, by government agencies, for example, being able to streamline their own back office processes as a result of now getting, instead of getting a, you know, a, a lorry load of paper, getting an electronic stream of, of, of data. Um, did you hear the evidence of Susan Harding? Who gave evidence? No, I didn't. No, I didn't know. Was she someone who ultimately reported to you? Do you remember? Her? Yes, Sue. Sue was uh, the uh, program management for for Impact. Yes. Yeah, and um, she told the inquiry that the decision to remove the suspense, suspense account function came from above her. Was that your decision, or was that the Impact Program Delivery Board? Who would that have been? I I, I don't recall. I don't recall making that decision. That's not to say I wasn't involved in it, but I don't particularly recall it. Um, do you recall who would have made that decision or who would have been at that level? I think the, um, I th I think the, the process ownership would have been whoever was um, running uh, transaction processing at the time. They would be the, the process owner here. Um, as... as, as in charge of project management, we, we didn't actually we didn't actually make up the requirements. The requirements came from the sponsor. So in in this case, with impact, the, the sponsoring unit would have been um, transaction processing. Uh, just as with if we change the method of handling um, handling uh, uh, TV licenses or something like that, then. Um, I need to be careful. We may have lost TV licenses by then. But say, a, a, you know, a road tax. It will be driven by the account team who were acting on, 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 on behalf of the DVLA. They would drive the requirements. They would decide what was what was delivered. Our job was to deliver it. 
So the policy decisions made in the impact programme weren't your responsibility or didn't come from No, they weren't, no. They would lie with the, with the business unit. That uh, Now, that's not to say we, we wouldn't be involved in the decision-making by that policy unit. Um, if we could bring up POL 00029293, please. Um, this is a major incident report dated the 24th of August 2004, um, and we can see it's a document generated by Fujitsu, um, and it relates to the S60 release. Um, if we scroll down, please, your name is not on the on the list of for distribution, um, but if we but we can see there external distribution is Post Office Limited Library plus reviewers, and if we turn over the page and scroll down, we can see this was sent to someone called Dave Hulbert. Yeah. Who is Dave Hulbert? Dave Hulbert worked in the service management team, and uh, he, he he I believe was was responsible for managing the, the service from Fujitsu. Um, there was a, back in the, back in the early, early days, there was a piece of work done by PA Consulting, which uh, created the framework for the setup of service management in, in post office. And uh, that unit was embedded in the operations directorate. So we, in, uh, in my area would deliver the project, but once it was delivered, once it was rolled out, uh, control of what happened passed to service management, and they would deal with day-to-day -day incidents. If there was an incident that uh, affected the, um, a large number of post offices, then we would normally be called in to provide uh, support and, and very often would take over managing that uh, that incident but at in this that case higher level, though. At, that, at that higher level this uh, this incident would have been managed by Dave and that, that that team well if we turn to page five um, and scroll down please um, the scope of this document is the scope of this report covers the failures of Fujitsu services to deliver AP client data to a number of AP clients, those of which do not receive files on all seven days of the week between the period 10th of July to 15th of July 2004. It also covers the failure to produce automated APS reconciliation reporting accurately in the form of the daily CTS file produced between the 10th of July 2004 and 29th of July. It should be noted that whilst the automated process was non-operational, manual reporting was being covered daily. Um, and if we look down at the management summary, um, midway through um, that the first paragraph, it states, it was suggested that this file was considerably less than would have been normally expected, the approximate value of transactions being reduced by up to 300 million. And if we turn over to page six, and we scroll down, we can see a detailed explanation of the incident. Um, and if we look at the headline figures at the bottom, we can see that there were 581, 481 transactions in the past three files that were not processed. These included reverse reversal pairs that should not be sent to clients. There are 578 and 91 transactions transactions not placed into client transmission files and over the page these transactions had a value of uh, 22 million um, is this the type of thing that would have been escalated to your team um, I don't recall it having been so I, I do I do recall the, the the incident but I don't recall uh, my team being asked to uh, provide assistance in sorting this matter when you say you recall the incident, how did you come to hear about well, it? Well, because it was, um, I mean, clearly, I mean, we weren't passing customer data. But bear in mind what's behind this is someone paying their gas bill or their electricity bill. Uh, if the data doesn't get through to um, the, the utility company, uh, that person's bill's not settled, and they get a red letter. Um, so this was this was something of hyper. It was it was an embarrassing it was an embarrassing incident. 
did it give you cause for concern in the system itself? Uh, uh, well, it, of, of course it did because, um, you know, it, it, it had such a, a, a significant impact. Um, but, you know, we, we didn't step in um, on, on every single incident, only where uh, the small team of uh, architects that was nested within my department were required to give specialist advice, and I don't recall them being asked on, on, on this particular occasion. Would this type of issue ever be raised or escalated to board level? Oh, I, I, undoubtedly, this would have been uh, reported through to, uh, to, to board level. I mean, there was a, a process of directorate uh, reporting into, into the board, and uh, uh, I, I can't imagine that the ops directorate wouldn't have included this in that re report. Uh, but I would have expected it, in any case, to have been uh, raised by the op director with the, with the managing director anyway in the normal course of things. Um, if we could turn up uh, POL 00021485. These are the minutes of a board meeting held in ah. the 13th of October 2004. Um, I can't see this incident having been reported in this meeting, but you're quite sure it would have been at some point. Well, this is... When I... Sorry, when I, when I said previously the board, this would be the executive management team of post office... Of Post Office Limited. Um, okay, I, 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 I don't recall the. Uh, I mean, I, I attended for this one item, at, at this board meeting, um, as as acting IT director. I didn't have a seat, on this board, so I, I can't really, um, address the the process at that board. I mean, I think it, the board, uh, I think the board only met, uh, three or four times a year anyway, uh, and I don't think it dealt with operational issues it dealt with uh, more str things at a more strategic level so those kind of incidents wouldn't have made it their way the operational if you I, I can't, as I say I, 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 I didn't attend that meeting on a regular basis so I, I'm not really familiar with with the process of that 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 uh, that board meeting there, there will be others who would be and this particular board meeting as you said you did attend and that was if we turn to page 10. Um, I'm scrolling down. This was to present the Horizon Next Generation business case. Yeah. Um, do you want to explain what that was? I, I think this was... Um, can you remind me of the date of that meeting again? Yes, yeah, so this is the 13th of October 2004. Yeah, this would have been... Um, this would have been funding, I think, to um, carry out the initial stages of, of, of the work. Um, I think anything over a million, million pounds had to go to the group to get approval. And as such, it would, it would pass through, um, it would pass through the, the, the post office board. I don't think this would have been the final business case asking for approval for um, the project proper, I th which I, I forget the exact number, but it was around 125 million. It certainly wasn't that case, but it was the, 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 the money, if you like, to do the initial, uh, the initial stages of the project. And that was because the current Fujitsu contract was going to expire in 2010, and it was going to be the work, your proposal yeah. for the work. Well, well, what triggered the whole thing was... Um, I think the account manager in Fujitsu at the time was a, a guy called Ian Lamb, and he um, he had a regular. I mean, the account manager would have a regular meeting with the IT director, and he 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 walked into Alan's office one day, and he drew on a flip chart the the cost curve of the Legacy Horizon, and then a cost curve for um, this idea they had to replace the existing uh, infrastructure, and it showed a very very big. Uh, cost gain, and that triggered off uh, the, the work that became eventually Horizon Online. Uh, that was the origins of, of, of this. And yes, it um, you know, given the lead time on the system of this this stage, then it did. It, it only made sense if you were talking about a contract extension, uh, because it would have it would have taken us pretty close to uh, the expiry date of the existing contract, 2010, before the system was was implemented. 
and if we could turn up RMG, I think it's 6044. This would have been the business case that you wrote on the 1st of September, so around this time, so 1st of September 2004. Yeah. And this, this, this again is, is acting, asking for the money to do, for the initial stages of the, of the project, uh, not for, at this stage, we're not getting approval for the 125 million, which, I mean, I think, if, if, I, if I remember it correctly, uh, not even the, um, the group board could actually approve it. It had to go to government to, uh, to get, get, to get authority. And if we turn to page two and scroll down, this sets out a summary, your summary of why do it. And it sets, says Horizon NG significantly reduces, reduces the cost of IT compared to a do nothing baseline, no branch hardware refresh and consequent increasing maintenance costs. Horizon Next Generation is estimated to deliver ongoing cash savings of 25 million plus over the life of the proposed extended contract to 2015. So part of the business case was the saving of costs. Is that right? Oh, absolutely. And and uh, I mean, one of the one of the things that we achieved in the revised contract was um, the the legacy contract had cost escalators, um, which increased significantly the cost of the system e each year. So uh, by um, I, I don't think we. That there were no cost increases allowed, but we really drove down how much Fujitsu could increase the cost of the contract year by year. And I think there was another, eventually in the business case, there was another 25 million per annum uh, claimed for avoiding those, uh, those cost increases through the new contract. So it's a very, very substantial cost case. Um, Chair, I'm mindful of the time. Um, it's one minute to, I think it's one minute to 11. Oh, I think you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry, Chair. Right. So just so that we're coordinated, I'm two minutes behind you, but that doesn't matter. We'll go by the clock in the, we'll go by the, clock in the room. So we'll now um, stop hearing evidence. And anybody who wishes to leave, please do so. And um, anybody who wishes to join us, please do so. And then um, in a few seconds, I don't think we need to be completely synced with 11 o'clock throughout the country. I'll announce that we'll observe a minute silence, all right? Has all movement in, in the inquiry room finished, uh, Ms. Kennedy? Sorry, Chair, you broke for a moment there. What, what did you ask? Is there any more movement taking place, or are we, everybody settled now? I think everybody's settled. Fine. Well, then, uh, we will commence our minute silence now. Thank you, everyone. We'll now adjourn until 11.15. Thank you, Chair. <coughs>
Hello, Chair. Hello there. Um, Mr Smith, before the break, we were discussing Next Generation Horizon, which became Horizon Online. Um, if we could pull up FUJ 00098040. Um, this is a slideshow that was done by you in September 2010. Um, can you just tell us a bit about how you came to prepare this? Um, yes. Um, when I finished with the post office, uh, um, senior people in Fujitsu uh, felt it was uh, would be advantageous if they engaged me uh, to do some consultancy work. Um, I'm not sure that was entirely welcomed by the, the account team who uh, Gavin and uh, his, his boss were, were fairly new brooms in Fujitsu, but the, the account team um, kind of welcomed my involvement because there'd been such a change in personnel that they'd lost all the history of, of what, had, what had gone on. And so what they asked me to do was to write the story of of Horizon, you know, as best as I could remember it. Uh, and this is this is what I produced. Um, and if we turn to page 71 of this document. Throughout the slideshow, as you say, you set out the various releases. Um, this is the section where you deal with yeah. what became Horizon Online, is that right? That's right, yeah. And um, this is this is the, uh, the Ian Lamb approaching Alan Barry is the thing I referred to before the break, yeah. Yeah. Um, and if we turn it over onto page 73, um, it sets out on the slide there some of the issues we were also discussing before the break of getting po uh, the post office on board with this um, and the fact that it was a very large project that would take up a lot of time and money. Um, if we could then turn to page 77. You describe there how getting uh, Fujitsu to agree, um, or getting an acceptable, getting to an acceptable proposal from Fujitsu was a long and arduous process. Can you describe what you meant by that? Well, we, uh, as this slide describes, we used the Gartner organisation to um, work through what the service or what was being proposed should cost, both in terms of development cost, but also in terms of annual running costs. And um, Fujitsu came up with the proposition and you know, to, to, to add balance, I mean, I think it wasn't just Fujitsu's fault. I think our own architects, um, I think they, they designed the system that it would have been ideal for us to have had instead of Legacy Horizon. Um, and um, it didn't meet, it didn't meet the Gartner uh, levels in terms of development costs, and it had this upward curve with on ongoing operating costs um, with year-on-year -year escalations. So there was, there was a gap between Fujitsu's initial proposal and um, the, um, the guideline, if you like, that we'd used within the group to say, we, we won't do this, this competitively. We'll, we'll go down a non-competitive route. Um, I mean, it, it eventually came to the point that uh, my colleague Ian O'Driscoll and I sat with Clive Morgan and Liam Foley from Fujitsu and told them, we are walking away from Fujitsu. We will, we will go and do this in, in a different way. Um, that resulted in a changed approach from Fujitsu uh, and particularly taking on board the fact that all the major developments, I mean, there were no more clients left to re-engineer the products so a system that was designed to support that intensive you know period of change that we've gone through was no longer required and uh, 
We, we also um, put on the table some requirements in terms of how things might evolve in the future. And th this involved breaking the contract down into a number of different areas, which could be competed separately. So we were trying to move Fujitsu into a space where they would be the systems integrator, but not necessarily the provider of all the, 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 the services. And uh, I mean, this was taken on board by, by Fujitsu and they came up with a proposal uh, that, that met the goals uh, underpinned by the Gartner work, which, which have been embedded not only in post offices business plan, uh, but also aided and abetted by McKinsey's in, in the, the, group, the group plans. Um, and it was on that basis that we, we contracted. You mentioned that the initial proposal from Fujitsu was what, on the basis of what you would have ideally had rather than Legacy Horizon. Were you not surprised by that, given that it was Fujitsu who were handling Legacy Horizon? Um, well, it, th th this was not so much about the functionality of the system. Th this, was a, this was about... Um, this was about, so for example, one of, the, um, one, one of the things in the proposal was to use one of the data centers as the, the test environment. Uh, now that was you know, pretty radical stuff, but also expensive, expensive sort of stuff. Now it would have been, I mean, there was, a, there was an issue um, that emerged uh, in 2004 where because the, the volume testing had had to be a result of testing and uh, modeling, uh, a, a design implementation fault was, was not picked up. Now, if you were using one of the data centers as your test environment, that would have been, that would have been identified. So there was a lot of learning, if you like, from things that had, uh, that had, had gone less well during Legacy Horizon that were built into this proposal, better way of working up requirements and turning those into design, that sort of stuff, which is all, would all have been appropriate to, um, to what happened during the lifetime of Legacy Horizon with the, you know, this, this constant um, period of change, but was less appropriate to a period where we expected change to be uh, a much more, on a much more modest level. Uh, you mentioned that you then took the proposal to the Post Office Board. If we turn to page 88. Um, this slide records what your memory in 2010 mm -hmm. was of, of that process um, and the questions that were in your mind at the time. Is there anything in addition to what's on the slide that you want to tell the inquiry? No, I think that, that, that summarises the position as I understood it. Was part of the problem, the last bullet point on the slide, what's the alternative? Well, the alternative would have been... Um, you know, one of the things I think that was a concern at the time of going to competition was uh, the sheer amount of management effort that were required in the business to, uh, to go through to, to get there, plus then working with a new supplier. Um, now, now, there were, I think there were some, uh, uh, there were some arrangements in the, in the contract that if we change the supplier that resources could, and knowledge could be moved across from, from Fujitsu. But I mean, that was seen as a, a, taking the whole thing and shifting it elsewhere was seen as uh, a step too far. Easier to stay with what you know. Easier to stay with what we know. But I say that the, the, um, the, what, we, what we came to in the end was something which did allow breaking out. So for instance, data centers and competing those in the marketplace and then requiring Fujitsu to uh, manage the process of phasing out their data centres and integrating uh, a new supplier into the, uh, into the overall service. Uh, and that, that was seen, I think, at the time as being a, a more manageable way forward than taking the whole, the whole thing and replacing it in one go. If we could turn to page 94 of the slideshow. Um, 
this records the stage at the holding board approval mm. um, and the first bullet point records that the post office was technically bankrupt at that stage. Um, how did that fact uh, impact on you doing your job? Well, it was a, it, it was a, a bit of a roadblock at the time because uh, I think, as it says here, the directors of the, of the business would have been uh, uh, criminally liable if they had approved a major project like this with a business that was technically bankrupt. Um, I mean, it was a... Um, you know, it was something that was, was overcome eventually, but I think it built in a, a delay of a number of months before we could actually move forward. So there's an element of frustration, having got to a, a, a proposition that we, um, you know, we could support, not being able to move forward as quickly as we, we might have been able to. Um, that document could come down, please. Um, if we could turn to POL 00070492, please. Um, this is an email chain oh, right. um, from the 22nd of November 2005, and your name is mentioned here. We're going to go through it in a moment in detail in relation to attending a meeting concerning Lee mm. Castleton. Um, if we could turn up um, your second witness statement, please, which is WITN 05290200. And page 11, please. And looking at paragraph uh, 28, it says it was towards the end of 2004 when completely out of the blue I received a telephone call from Mandy Talbot, who was in that email chain we looked at a moment ago. She explained that she worked for the group solicitors team and had, recently been rec and had recently been assigned to Paul Cases. She was dealing with a civil case referred to as Cleveleys, which the post office was on its way to losing. She was most concerned that this would create a precedent which could be used in future cases. She wanted to know if I could suggest a way to retrieve the situation. So is this your introduction to Mandy Tolbert, the Cleveleys case? It, it was indeed, yes. And what was the Cleveleys case? The inquiry's heard about it before, but what do you remember of it? Well, I, I guess the, the, the th I mean, where Mandy was was that a, 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 an expert had been appointed uh, jointly, I believe, by the post office and uh, the defendant. And it had basically said, yeah, Horizon could have caused uh, this, this problem. And what Mandy was, Mandy was really, what I remember is Mandy was really, really concerned that this would create a precedent. And, you know, could I... Could I suggest a way that we could get out of this, this, this hole? And, I mean, the only thing I could suggest to her was to access the, uh, the, audit, the audit file uh, for the branch and to test the proposition that Horizon was, was to blame. Um, scrolling down in your witness statement, um, I think you, say, you record that. You say the only way to counter this... Um, in my view, was to demonstrate that Horizon had not created the discrepancy, and the only way to do that was the audit file. Yeah, well, I mean, the the only way that basically I believe would produce incontrovertible proof that it wasn't Horizon, or I might add, had Horizon caused the problem, it would also surface that Horizon had had caused it. But a moment ago, you said it was the the audit file was the only thing you could think of. Um, without going into the details of the uh, of, of the case, yes. But wouldn't this have been a good time to go into the details of the case and to do a proper review on the integrity of Horizon? It wasn't. I mean, it, it wasn't part of my my brief to do so. What do you mean by your brief? Well, I, I, I was there as a project manager to deliver to deliver projects, not to um, not to get involved in the whole process of um, you know dealing with uh, sub-postmasters. But you just told the inquiry a moment ago that you got a call from Andy Talbot asking yeah. her if she, you could get her or the team out of a hole. Is that not becoming involved? Um, yes, but, I mean, it was... The, the, you know, the audit, the, the audit file was uh, 
and the processes around it was something that was specified in the original horizon, I believe, by the security team. So it was there. I was simply pointing her in the direction of what already existed. And at that time, did you think the audit file was the start and end of the matter in terms of the integrity of the system? Well, in, um, yes, I believe it. I believe it would actually. Um, you know, if there was if there was a suggestion that the system had introduced an error, accessing the audit file. The audit file. The audit file was a, a record of what the sub postmaster had asked, or the, the sub postmaster or the, the the office staff had asked the system to do. It wasn't an audit of what Horizon had done. And so it was possible against that audit file to test what Horizon had done to see if it was actually in accordance with the sub-postmaster's instructions. Did you think, I remember there was a problem with the EPOS system during the design of Legacy Horizon. Might there be an uh, error introduced in something like that? No, I didn't, no, no. Um, if we could return to the email thread at POL 00070492, please. Um, could you give an overview of who each of these individuals, Mandy Tolbert, Tom Beezer, and um, Stephen Dilly are, please? Um. Sorry, can you repeat the names again, one by one? Uh, yeah, so they're on, they should be in front of you. Mandy Talbot. Well, Mandy was from, from the, solicitor, the group solicitors department. Um, Tom Beezer. Can't recall, I'm afraid. Or Stephen Dilling. Can't recall. Um, and if we scroll down to the bottom of that page, we can see the initial email is from Tom Beezer. And it says, Mandy, I have called and left a message. I'll try again later this afternoon. The points I want to dis discuss are, in short form, a full set of papers is being prepared for you. I suggest that you and Stephen Dilley and me have a con call at your convenience to discuss and plan the next steps in this matter. Three, an updated spreadsheet is being prepared listing all the Horizon-related cases. From my end, uh, you're, you are aware of Blake, uh, Blakey and Patel, we can discuss the level of information you require on each or all of the Horizon-related matters when we speak. Um, I have put out to the team the message that there are to be no proceedings issued relating to Horizon-based claim without your knowledge and OK. Um, there's a spreadsheet mentioned there. Um, at this stage, the post office is already preparing a spreadsheet of Horizon-based cases. Is that right? Yes. One of one of the um, so resulting from Cleveland's, there were a series of meetings, I believe, with interested interested parties, and one of the um, one of the issues that surfaced was that there was not one place where all cases, both criminal and civil, uh, were consolidated, uh, partially due to the fact that. The civil cases, I think, were de dealt with by the retail line without the involvement of security, but also the fact that the uh, organisation of the post office um, through various iterations was regionally based. So um, there wasn't even a, a sort of a consolidated view from the regional teams. So I think this is, this is um, I wasn't included in this, uh, this particular conversation, but I think the uh, this is an attempt to pull all of this um, activity together in one one consolidated statement. And were you aware of that spreadsheet at the time? Um, I, I think there's a reference in the earlier letter to it being tabled at the, the meeting, so I, I, I would have been at, at that meeting. If we scroll up to that um, the top email again, please. Um, and it says, the third paragraph, I'm attending a meeting with... David Smith, Tony Utting and Claire on Friday to discuss this case, but also plan a way forward. So this type of problem does not occur again. Um, what do you think this type of problem means? What's being referred to there? Well, I mean, it's getting into a situation where we're going to lose a case. And I mean, the, the, the recommendation uh, you know, at the time was to access, you know, where where we got into proceedings and Horizon was claimed to be the fault of the problem was access the audit file. 
the, um, the immediate issue was that security had, um, I think it was uh, the right to access the audit file 100 times in a financial, uh, financial year. Um, they were currently using all of those um, opportunities. Um, they were only resourced to deal with, with 100 uh, accesses of the, of, of the data. Uh, if you extended this to civil cases, it needed uh, more resource uh, to process the data. I mean, this, this could be, for some unknown reason, a million pounds for 100 accesses was, was numbers that floating around in my head. I mean, I don't, I don't know whether that's right, but for some reason, that's, that's what's there. Um, and I, I think as part of the Rule 10 documents that I received, there's, um, there's an email there from Tony Utting, who was from the security department, where he had, uh, he had put together a proposition in terms of increasing the resource within security to enable them to handle the um, additional um, additional accesses of the um, audit files, were the funding to, to 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 come forward. But again, coming back to the type of problem, you said the problem was losing the case, not getting. To well, the pro the problem was how you established how do you establish so against it it was Horizon. How you established a watertight case that it wasn't Horizon. How you establish a watertight ca case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was your concern at the time. That, that was Mandy's concern at the time. And that was, say, it was, it was not an answer that I had, uh, I had come up with because the security team, before Horizon was implemented, had specified this audit file facility so that they could, when they were prosecuting sub postmasters, they could demonstrate that Horizon wasn't to blame for the. Uh, discrepancy between the, the system and the physical cash balance. But the idea of checking the audit file came from you, didn't it, when you spoke to Mandy Talbot? My, my extending it from beyond the, the, the security, sorry, the, the uh, criminal cases to the civil cases. Um, what do you remember about this meeting, um, if anything, nothing. about Lee Castleton? No, no nothing. Um, do you, rem you, do you remember the case at the time at all? Um, I, I, I remember a couple of phone calls from, from Mandy. I remember her basically saying that, um, um, that they'd accessed data and that Castleton solicitors had, um, had disappeared <laughs> left field, um, believed that they had seen the data and they recommend that he, uh, that, that he settled. Um, and then when the case was actually found in our, our favour, Mandy was somewhat, um, somewhat ecstatic, I think was, was the right word, because particularly in the judge's summing up, I think he, he, he used some words that we, I guess, you know, we would have wished him to, to, to write about the integrity of, of Horizon. I mean, I did receive in the Rule 10 document a, a very extensive bundle of, of documents uh, and I went through all of them, and I absolutely, you know, uh, underpinned my recollection that I wasn't involved in any way in the detail of this because I'm not included in any of the that correspondence, other than I think this 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 letter. Were you pleased about the judgment in the Castleton case? Um, yeah, well, obviously, that I was pleased that you know we had uh, we'd run the case, but I mean. I, um, Yes, but I mean, I wasn't gippy pleased. I mean, you know, you, you don't want to deal with these cases at all. Did you feel the Castleton case shut down for a while? Any well, I think suggestion it, it, that there was an issue with the integrity of Horizon. With, with no, I think it shut Mandy down for a while. You know, phoning me about the issue because I think you know she felt that the um, she had a way forward in in, in dealing with these uh, cases. It was when. Um, you know, the interest in the media, um, you know, started to, to, to surface that I got uh, re-involved. Although I don't think it was Mandy that got me re-involved. My recollection, it was the, the PR team, um, which again was a group function, started to get concerned about um, the reputational damage that was being caused by the, uh, 
the stuff that was appearing in the media. So it was the public relations team that then... I, but I, that, that's my recollection, yeah. yeah. Um, that document can come down, thank you. Um, if we could turn up um, FUJ 00080526, please. Um, this is a document um, prepared um, in October 2009 um, by a Mr Gareth Jenkins. Um, and if we turn to your second witness statement, which is WITN 05290200, Um, and we look at the bottom of that page. Um, you set out that you can't be sure, but you believe this document was produced as a follow-up to your telephone conversation that you had with Gareth Jenkins, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Um, how did that conversation come about? So I think, I think the, the witness statement goes on to explain Yeah, should we turn it? over I, I, the next yeah. page? Yeah. Um, basically, I, I was... Uh, via finance I was asked to um, meet with uh, partners of Ernst & Young who were the group auditors um, and basically in preparation for that meeting I, I, I wanted to make sure that um, you know my, my understanding of certain facts were um, were, were was correct I didn't want to I didn't want to tell Ernst & Young something that wasn't right and so it covered two areas. Now, what I recall at the time was that, um, you know, one of the things that was being said by uh, a number of sub postmasters was that the, the, the circumstances which Horizon was creating these false balances was through power interruptions, uh, whether it be through storms or the, the, the grid failing or a power surge. And um, I think it's fair to say that the, 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 the original design of Horizon was, uh, and the choice of the Escher Repost product was very much driven by um, its ability to recover from, from such circumstances. The other was uh, around the audit file and the security around the audit file. I mean, um, I won't go into detail, but there were a lot of security procedures around that audit file which meant that when someone ac accessed it uh, it was possible to see that you were the only person that accessed it no one had been in before and had interfered with it um, so um, th that was that was the uh, that was the the reason why I I spoke to Gareth and and how, uh, and how did you come to be in touch with Mr Jenkins in particular I think I did it through the account team, so it would have been through. Su I think Susie Kirkham's name is mentioned on the document, and I would have, uh, I would have said to Susie, "Look, I've got this, um, I've got this meeting coming up with uh, Ernst and Young. Um, can you put me in contact with uh, someone who can uh, address these issues for me?" Um, and she gave you the name. Gareth. Uh, I think Gareth phoned me. I think Gareth phoned me. So she she she. Uh, triggered Gareth contacting me to uh, go through this. And did you understand him as being the expert at this time? I understood him as being an expert. I mean, his name used to crop up uh, quite quite frequently when when uh, when we were dealing with with, with stuff. So uh, he was he was well known. And yes, he was an, uh, I, he wasn't the only expert, but he, his name was was pretty prominent. Um, just looking at your witness statement again, um, at that paragraph two and the bit that's on the screen now, um, it says the sub-postmasters had no hard evidence that Horizon had produced false balances, but there were suggestions that power interruptions might yeah. have been the cause. What hard evidence, in your mind, could the sub-postmasters have produced um, to show that there was an issue with Horizon at this stage? Um, it's a great question. Um, it, it would have been, I think... Um, it, it, I try and answer this without getting into too much too much detail, but I mean it's possible on on, on horizon to um, at the start of the day you get a till, you log on to the system, it's it's you, it identifies all the transactions until you log off to you and to that till. At the end of the day session, you count up the cash. 
Uh, if somehow the, the cash is out of, out of balance, that will be flagged up. Now, not all branches did this, um, but from that you could spot a difference. You know, in a, in, in, in a lot of offices, the, I mean, I, I worked on the counter on a number of occasions during industrial disputes, and uh, I, I remember doing that, going through that process, and ending up with very significant differences. Um, you know, I cried help, and the, um, the branch manager or assistant branch manager would come along, and they would go through a checklist of obvious things that uh, I might not have done. Uh, and in both those cases, actually, they, they immediately resolved the problem. Uh, but you might go through that checklist, and then you, 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 might, um, you might conclude, well, I can't spot an obvious error. And at that stage, you might pick up the phone to the help desk to trigger off, um, you know, to trigger off a, a, a help. You know, this, is, this has happened. I don't think it was me. I think it was, was the system. And what hard evidence would you have at that stage that it was the system? Well, you wouldn't. You, all you'd have is an unexplained difference. So then you would be in the hands of the post office. You would, you would then be in the hands of, um, of the, the call handlers. Um, and, you know, they would go through, I mean, the various levels of um, various levels involved in, in phoning up. So the, the first level would uh, probably work through scripts. Eventually, eventually you, you, you would get to a more technical uh, desk who would look into it and indeed in the horizon issues trial there's there's a story of how um, of how some of those uh, calls eventually got to the people who uh, understood how the system worked and in investigated the detail but you accept on the basis of the horizon system in front of a sub postmaster sometimes there would be no hard evidence there available would, to them there, there would be no hard evidence available to them no um, if we could turn back up FUJ 00080526, please. So turning back to this report, mm. you said that Mr Jenkins phoned you. How long did that conversation last? Uh, it, w it wouldn't have been a short one because... Um, With respect to technical architects, they didn't always speak in, uh, you know, everyday language. So I, I would have had to do uh, a, a fair bit of testing of, of understanding. So I, I can't imagine um, we discovered, um, sorry, that, that we, did, we, we covered this, uh, this area in, in a short conversation. It would have, it would, I mean, I didn't run a stopwatch on it, obviously, but it would it would have taken at least an hour, I would have thought, to go over this sort of uh, material. Do you recall whether you find Mr Jenkins particularly difficult to understand, or do you have any recollection? No, no more so than any other technical architect. I mean, um, you know, one of, the, uh, one of the problems with this whole area is the, um, the use of abbreviations, and, uh, you know, which can be deeply layered. So um, it is no more difficult to understand than uh, a any other person. If we could turn to page five of this document. Um, it sets out the purpose. It says, this document is submitted to post office for information purposes only and without prejudice. What do you understand without prejudice to mean in this context? Um, I think I would have read that heading at the, uh, at, at the top of the page. It was, it was basically for my use and internal use only, and we weren't to... I mean, I think it quite explicitly says that uh, elsewhere that we we shouldn't we shouldn't use this um, this document in uh, any court cases. So it was just for your understanding. It's for, it, it, that's yes. It was it was that was a, that was why I made you know made the contact with Fujitsu uh, to have this call in the first place. Um, and if we turn over onto page six, please. It's a, there's a section entitled The Horizon Data Integrity. Um, it says in the first paragraph, the Horizon system is designed to store all data locally on the counter's hard, di hard disk. Once the data has been successfully stored, there it is, in a, in, it is then in a replicated copy to the hard disks of any other counters in the branch, and in the case of a single counter branch, to the additional external storage on the single counter. 
data is also passed on from the gateway counter to the Horizon Data Centre using similar mechanisms. Did you know this before you had this conversation with Mr Jenkins? Or oh, I guess I, I, I knew this because this was, um, I think this goes back to um, one of the reasons why the Escher Repost um, product was, was chosen by Fujitsu. Um, in, in those days, dial-up telephone networks weren't terribly reliable. So in, in, in designing the system, it was, um, it was important that um, when there was an interruption in a transaction, that it was, was recoverable. And uh, I mean, this reflected the, uh, this, this reflected, um, you know, s some of the uh, important elements of the repost design. I mean, I met with Escher on, on, on a number of occasions as part of a, a, a user group. And uh, they would bore you silly on the, uh, the, the contents of that uh, particular paragraph. Um, the third paragraph then goes on to read, every record that is written to the transaction log has a unique incrementing sequence number. Yep. This means it's possible to detect if any tran uh, transitions records have been lost. Um, did you understand that before you received this report? Yes, I did. Um, and scrolling down again... Um, says that while a customer session is in progress, details of the transaction for that customer session are normally held in that computer's memory until the uh, customer session, often known as the stack, is settled. At that point, all details of the transactions, including any methods of payments used, are written to the local hard disk and replicated as described above. It should be noted that double entry bookkeeping is used when recording all financial transactions, i.e. for every sale of goods or services. There is a corresponding entry to cover the method of payment that's been used. When a stack is secured, it is written in such a way that either all the data is written into the local hard drive, hard disk, or none of it is written. The concept atomic rights is also taken into account when data is replicated to other systems, i.e. other counters, external storage or data center. Um, and scrolling down to the bottom, um, it states any failures to write to a hard disk after appropriate retries will result in the count of failing and needing to be restarted and so will be immediately visible to the user. Whenever data is retrieved for audit inquiries, a number of checks are carried out. One, the audit files have not been tampered with, i.e. the seals on the audit files are correct. Two, the individual transactions have their CRCs checked to ensure that they have not been corrupted. Three, a check is made that no records are missing. Each record generated by a counter has a, an incremental sequence number and check is made that there are no gaps in the sequencing. Reading this, did you then proceed on the assumption that, well, if the audit file says something, then we can rely on the audit file and it's correct? That's, that was my belief, yes. And did you understand that to be the key issue with data integrity in Horizon? And the answer to the post office's problems. Um, I, I believed it was. Um, I believed that this was a way of um, investigating uh, a claim that Horizon had caused a misbalance, or a, a, a wrong balance in the uh, the cash balance for the branch. Did you say to Mr Jenkins on the phone call, what about before it gets to the audit stage? Is there a way of telling that there's a bug or an error or something that otherwise has corrupted the data? Um, no, I didn't. I, I, I was asking him to uh, take me through the way in which the system recovered uh, transactions when there had been in interruption to the service. But it is entitled Horizon Data Integrity. Well, that was his title. That wasn't that wasn't my title. Um, and I said in my written statement that I understood data integrity to be a wider issue than the, the topics covered in this um, in this document. But if it is a wider issue, then why not ask him to address it and explain what be other because, issues? Because because I had one specific area of information that I wanted to validate my understanding of it before I met with Ernst & Young. I wasn't carrying out an investigation into data integrity. With the benefit of hindsight, do you think you should have? Do I think I should have? Um, I think that um, 
I mean, it's, it's, it's very difficult to answer that question without taking all the stuff that I know. So, for example, having read the Horizon Issues trial, and clearly, uh, when you take the totality of what was um, what was discovered, then more ought to have been done than was done. Should more have been done by you at this time? Well, <laughs> um, I read about. Uh, I would have. I would say. Uh, I read about. Uh, the issues that have arisen in the Horizon Issues trial for the first time in that Horizon Issues uh, in, in, in uh, Justice Fraser's uh, judgment. Who was it in the post office or Fujitsu who could have done more at this time? Well, it, I mean, the, the visibility of these, in, you know, these specific issues would have been within, within service management. Um, The, the issues uh, were all dealt with in, in, in different ways. I mean, there are a number of those issues where um, the resolution of the issue was, was quite quick. I mean, a lot, of the, a lot of the differences that were created were clearly were investigated and corrected. Um, so if you've got a bunch of issues coming up that are identified and corrected, uh, I mean, there would have been no question on those issues of a sub-postmaster being taken to court over them. And the, the evidence is there in, in abundance in Justice Fraser's uh, write-up of those, those issues. He, there's, there's, in the technical appendix, there's, there's constant reference to transaction corrections being raised. Um, but yes, taking the, if I'd have had that stuff laid out in front of me, I, I'd have felt inclined to... Um, to, to do something, to, you know, have a root and branch review of what's going on here. Do you remember the names of any of those people in that team who would have had that oversight? Um, th that, I remember one or two names of the people in the service management team. What, what I'd, I'd be less certain of is uh, what their particular roles were. And um, there was, in the service management team, I think, uh, varying over time who was, who was heading it, um, a difference in, in the level of, t you know, some people believe that, you know, this was for the supplier to manage and it was for the supplier to get on with it. You didn't, uh, you, you didn't spend a lot of time, um, you know, second-guessing them. Or picking uh, over the data. Yeah, that's right. This, this was for the supplier to do and, and not for... Um, it, it's the linkages here, I think. It's, it's what, what's missing in all of this is whether those people in service management or indeed with Fujitsu would have drawn a line from these, um, from, from these incidents to uh, postmasters appearing in a court. But you felt unable to draw that line is what you're, you're telling us on the basis of what you knew. What I'm saying on the basis of what I knew, I mean, I didn't know about a lot of this stuff that was going on. It wasn't, you know, these, some, some, of, some of these involved multiple post offices, some involved only one or two post offices, and these weren't the kind of issues that would come across my, my desk. If, I had, if it had come across my desk, then I, I would have felt inclined to, uh, you know, to, to ask some serious questions about what was going on. And what, but whether I'd have made the immediate contact sorry, the immediate connection with sub-postmasters appearing in court is, is, is a different issue. And you don't view Lee Castleton's case, for example, as coming across your desk? Uh, it did, but, but bear in mind that the, um, the, the, the process actually, I mean, to quote the judge himself, the integrity of Horizon is, is beyond, beyond question. Um, if we could turn back for a moment to Horizon Online... Um, when I, in March 2010, if we could turn up FUJ 00094472, please. These are the notes of the Horizon Next Generation Joint Progress Release Board meeting. Um, and we can see that the pro programme manager is Mark Burley, who we heard from a couple of days ago. Mm. He reported in to you, is that right? That's correct, yes. And did you work well together? Uh, I think so. <laughs> don't know what he said. <laughs> um, and did you work closely with him on this? Um, he was one of a number of reports. I mean, 
Mark and there'd probably be, um, you know, during a week, Mark and I would have two or three conversations ab about progress, uh, quite apart from more formal situations when we would meet and uh, and, and discuss it. I mean, I, I I tried not to sit on his shoulder and second guess uh, his moves. Uh, also, um, you know, I was at this stage uh, probably about. 10, 12 working days away from retiring. Um, if we turn to page three, if we scroll down first actually on that page, we can see that you were on the distribution list. If mm. we turn to page three and scroll down. And down again, please. Um, at the bottom of that page, it records actions and points arising from the previous meeting. Um, one of the issues there it recorded is trial report, final balance issue, PN to check if the proposed workaround is acceptable. Um, and then it says that post office have requested this to be a hot fix as it is required before we migrate any further branches. Would you have been across this level of detail or is that something that you would have left to Mr. Burley? Um, I, think, I think I did get involved in this. Um, again, the, the, the Rule 10 disclosure of documents, I think uh, buried in there was, was a document that referred to my uh, involvement. And I was concerned. I mean, I, I think this was, this, was, um, this was reporting two conflicting numbers. And I was concerned, uh, I th and I, th I think it was me that drove this activity, um, I was concerned about the, the potential implications of that in terms of um, data integrity. And I think there are, there are references in there to um, legal teams being, being involved. Um, if we could um, take that document down, please, and pull up POL 00002268, please. Um, this is an email thread from uh, February 2010, and it's between, um, we can see there, Andrew Wynn, Hayley Fowler, Dave Hulbert, who we've discussed before, you, Jacqueline Whittam, and Anne. Um, and it's about the media coverage of Horizon. Is this the PR team, or is this, I know Andy Wynn is in branch improvement and liaison, but are you being brought in again? I... <laughs> The only name I recognise on that, apart from my own, is, is Dave Holbert's. Um, so I, I can't recall where these, these people were, but it could be that it was the, uh, the PR team. I, I, I don't know is the answer. Um, if we could scroll over to page two, please. Um, this is an email from Hayley Fowler to you, Michelle Graves and Dave Holbert. Say, so Media Inquiry Horizon. Um, We've had a media inquiry from a retail news agent magazine. They have been talking to a sub postmaster who has said that his branch was closed in September 2008 because of financial irregularities, which he claims are the fault of Horizon. I am providing our stock line, which states the system is robust, but in case we get more questions on this, please can you advise if you have any record of an investigation for this in individual and any relevant details? Um, why were you sent this email directly? Don't know because you know I wouldn't have had um, the information that um, Haley was looking for. And who you said a moment ago, you don't remember these people. You have no idea who Haley Fowler was. No, I don't recall. I don't recall the name or Michelle Graves. Um, was that because you were becoming a bit of a point person for these media inquiries uh, and assisting <sighs> with setting out that the system was robust? I think that <coughs> people, if I go back to Mandy's contact, uh, Mandy's contact with me, uh, and likewise with the, the PR team, I think these people who were dealing with these issues were having difficulty getting the attention of senior people. And uh, I, I suspect that the, the PR team 
uh, have had some contact with Mandy, and it's for that reason they actually came to me. But I mean, I wouldn't have records of in investigation for individuals. I mean, that was not part of my, my role. Why do you think that they were having trouble getting hold of senior people? Did they tell you that? Or is that a guess? Uh, I, <laughs> with, with the Mandy stuff, I'm going back, I don't know how many years. And um, in all honesty, I can't be certain. But I, I, my memory is telling me that, that she used words to, to that effect. Um, and why would it have been that senior management wouldn't have wanted to know about this? Well, I can only, I can only guess. But um, I mean, again, I don't, I don't have never had visibility of all the action that post office took against uh, also postmasters. But I guess, um, I guess if all that action was, was successful, why would, you, why would you change anything? In the email, um, Ms Fowell says, I'm providing our stock line. Um, was there a stock line at this stage? that the system was robust? Um, if, if there was, um, you know, I, I wasn't aware of that line and certainly wasn't aware of, I mean, of putting that line to, to, together. So it didn't come from you? It, it, didn't, it didn't come from, I mean, neither was, I mean, I believe that uh, Fujitsu were involved in supporting um, certainly the security team and, and probably in civil cases, the, the, the conduct of the case, I, I, would, I can't recall ever being consulted about Fujitsu's involvement in it. Um, it. It probably would have fallen under the bailiwick of service management anyway, but I, I, you know, I was never consulted on uh, and never asked actually to participate in supporting the teams in, 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 in those actions. But would you have agreed with that position at the time? that the system was robust, and, that, and that's the position the post office took. If I, if I go back to my, my airline days, I was involved in a, a piece of work um, around um, automatic, automated ticketing. And there was a debate about whether it was necessary to still keep a paper copy of the, the ticket was printed or whether we could rely on the, um, on the electronic facsimile of that ticket. And uh, the project consulted widely. There were a number of QCs involved in that consultation include, and, and IT experts from outside the, um, the, the business. And in that debate, someone asked the question, could anybody ever stand up in a court of law and say that, automatic, that, that automated record could not be corrupted? Could you ever say it could never happen? And could anyone ever really stand up and say it could never happen, that Horizon could get it wrong, or that the back office checking systems could ever, could ever meet it? So um, I would have... I would qualify that by saying, you know, I had belief that the back office checks were were robust and would pick up um, any, any errors. And I say that's that's evidenced, I think, in the uh, in the, the the very detailed accounts that uh, Justice Fraser gave of the investigation of uh, the the bugs, defects, and issues that were were, were found. So, in short, at this stage, you would have said yes. That is correct. This I would have said it would. Uh, yes, I think in, in broad terms, I've said the whole th the whole thing end to end gave you certain that, that um, it would be. You know, the, the system was robust. It it had inbuilt checks and balances that should prevent uh, a rise in creating a a, a a false balance that resulted in a sub postmaster being prosecuted. Um, and if we could go back over onto the first page up the train and scrolling down a bit. There's a bit of discussion about this um, case. You don't respond on this email to say, well, hold on a minute, maybe we should look at X, Y, or Z, or give Fujitsu a call and see if there's anything to this. No, because 
I wouldn't have been handling the, you know, it would have been, for, for anyone to respond to that in terms of the detail of what's being done, it would have, would have fallen within Dave Holbert's area of responsibility. Because, you know, issues, issues with the day-to-day -day service, with the service management to, to, to manage. And if you scroll up again just to the last email in the chain, um, it states there that we are due to restart our former agent debt recovery process. I just wanted to check the recent communications to ensure that nothing there to suggest we should not do this. Is that how you understood the post office's approach to be? Is even when there was a dispute, you go ahead and you start the debt recovery process? I, 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 I really don't. I don't understand this. This. So I don't understand. Uh, why the process needed restarting. I, I just don't understand it. And I say I wouldn't have been involved anyway. Uh, I think I, you know, this would have, if, if anyone in that email would have been involved in that, uh, it would have been Dave Holbert. Um, if we could uh, turn up FUJ00092745, sorry, 754, please. And sorry to jump around a bit. This is back in the chronology slightly, 28th of January. Um, if we, this is another uh, note of the Horizon Next Generation Joint Progress Release Board meeting. So on the one hand, you have the discussion of Horizon Online going on. And on the other, you're also involved in discussions regarding the integrity of Legacy Horizon. These, these two threads of things are coming up around the same time, quite mm -hmm. close to when you retire. Isn't that right? That's correct, yes. Um, and if we go over the page to page three, and scroll down, um, at 140.09, it states, the delay in the commencement of volume testing means we will not be able to perform a significant amount of testing before commencing the medium volume pilot. Hence, we need a significant amount of data to be collected from the live branches and data center. Do you remember whether um, there was less testing at this stage than was initially anticipated or planned? That's what the minute says. Yeah. And you, you, you go off the minute. You don't remember anything to the contrary. Well, the, 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 important, um, the important reference here is, is LF. LF, I believe, was Lee Farman, who's the te technical director of a company called AccuTest, and he was a, a testing specialist. And... Um, he basically is saying here, the, 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 the statement that closes the issue, that, that he believed that the level of, of testing was adequate for now. Now, I guess one would have to ask Lee what, it, what he meant for now. I, I, I suspect it was a quite, it would adequate for the purposes of a pilot. Um, and I would read into that that you would expect some follow-up before there was a rollout to ensure, to test check again whether the level of testing was adequate to roll out. Um, if we could then turn up FUJ00097159, please. This is from the same day. It's a Horizon Next Generation Release Authorization AG3 joint board. And you were there as head of change yes, was, yeah. and NIS. Um, was the priority at this stage to secure or to accept the Horizon Online system? This was release authorization, not acceptance. I see. So, so this is um, this is about the process of. So, it, the way these processes work, con contractual acceptance is you know it's set out contractually, and you you, you pass or fail the test, and at the end of it. Uh, you either accept or you don't. Uh, really, you can accept a product, but the release authorization process can say, um, nope, it's, it's not fit to go into uh, the network in its current state. And uh, there was an example of this, for instance, with CSR Plus, when actually in this instance, it was Fujitsu Services, uh, or ICL Pathways it then was, uh, service management team who said, no, we are missing some key control reports uh, and uh, therefore the release cannot go into live operation. But actually contractual acceptance had already been uh, achieved. Um, 
If we could turn forward in time then to FUJ 0092875, please. And if we could turn to page three. This is an email from Alan Dalvarez, um, who the inquiry heard from yesterday on, the, on Wednesday the 3rd um, of February. Um, you're not copied into this email chain. I believe it's an internal <coughs> Fujitsu one. Um, but if we scroll down, we can see that there are two um, issues that require fixing um, prior to being able to enter into a medium volume pilot. Um, it states that the decision has been taken to deploy HNGX to a further 10 branches with the migration button being pressed tomorrow for migration to complete on Friday. And there are two issues outstanding at that stage. There's the branch trading statement issue and the counter pauses in, um, in live. And what's recorded at paragraph four is, um, we had a meeting with post office this evening, uh, which Mark Burley led from the post office side. Post office are desperate for a date to start planning, rescheduling medium volume pilot. They accepted our position that we're not able to give this today. I expect that Mark will be keeping Dave Smith briefed, and my reading is that we're not in a position to give a target date by close of play tomorrow. It is likely to result in an escalation to Mike Young. At this stage, were you and um, your colleagues at the post office desperate for a start date um, or a date to start planning the medium volume pilot? That's what the document says. But they, this wasn't written by you. No, um, but, but this will be reflecting, I think, what was coming across from, from Mark and his team. Uh, and I've no reason to uh, disbelieve it. Do you remember at this time it being quite stressful trying to get everything ready for um, HNGX um, being fully rolled out? I think... I think I had uh, a degree of unease about the way, thing, the way things were progressing. Uh, there was pressure from, um, I think, from within the business to get on with it, because uh, clearly whilst we were rolling this, this thing out, other big things couldn't happen in, in, in the branch network. So, uh, I mean, matters were already being considerably delayed, and so I think there was a, a degree of pressure to, to, to crack on with it. Um, but I mean, I, I don't think that pressure would have ex extended to, you know, doing silly things, uh, moving ahead when there were, you know, serious issues that, uh, you know, would dictate that you shouldn't, this is not a sensible thing to be doing. So there would have been pressure to get on with it, crack on with it, um, but there would have also been a degree of caution. I think it is, I mean, I think there are a number of areas where uh, it's reflected in some of those JSB minutes that issues had to be cleared, or at least the business had to agree that, that there was a suitable workaround uh, to a particular issue before we moved we moved forward. You described pressure internally. Were you being quite forthright, the post office with Fujitsu, about timescales and, and needing to push on but not do something silly? Um, well, that, that would have been Mark who would have done that. I, I would imagine we would, yes, he would have done, yeah. And if we turn over to POL 0003299, please. This is the acceptance report for HNGX Acceptance Gateway 3. Um, and if we scroll down, this is something that you were sent. We can see your name on the distribution uh, list. Um, do you remember receiving this document? No, I don't. But I mean, I, um, I mean, I think the, the the documents that have been disclosed to me as part of this process are probably less than five percent of the total documents that I would receive. So, recalling individual documents is is, is beyond this aged memory. If we turn to page nine, please. Um, the introduction sets out that this document comprises the HNGX acceptance report to the HNGX acceptance board for the assessment of the progression through acceptance gateway three, readiness for pilot. Um, and if we scroll down, 
we can see that it sets out clearly what the purpose of the acceptance board is, which is to agree the acceptance status of the relevant release and provide the recommendation to the joint release authorization board. The proposed options that this board can select from are described in Appendix D. I think you say in your statement that you would have you thought that anything that would have affected acceptance would be disclosed in this report. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Um, there's one thing that you highlight at the bottom of page nine. If we scroll down again. Um, it states, it should be noted that there are also defects that are not linked to pool requirements and which are not the subject of acceptance incidents. A separate assessment of the status and significance of these has been undertaken and will be available for consideration at the Release Authorization Board. Do you remember what kind of defects those may have been? No, no, no I don't, but I seem to think in going through the documents that I received, there the, the were some... Uh, buried in another document, there were some references to what's, you know, what issues had actually come up un un under this heading. So there was, I think, the reason why I alluded to it in the um, in, in in my witness statement. Well, I, was, I was asked a question generally about was there other stuff that should be taken into account, and I pointed to this, and I, I think there was, and I can't recall the document, but there was evidence in in, in other documents that such evidence had been brought forward. Uh, I've no reason to believe at the time that uh, that, that wasn't complete. Um, I obviously can't talk to what subsequently happened after I left. Um, if we could then turn up FUJ 00094393, please. Um, this is um, RMGA uh, HNGX counter application review, um, and this one is dated the 25th of February uh, 2010. Um, do you remember this document? Um, I, I don't recall it from the time, um, but I do remember it now because it had been supplied to me and I've, I've worked through it in, in some detail. Um, and this was as far as you can recollect, the version that was supplied to you? I, I, I don't recall whether I saw this issue in this level of detail at the time. I think this relates to the Derby, yeah. uh, the Derby issue. Uh, I would have known about the Derby issue because Mark would have brought it, brought it to me. I, I, I can't say whether I did or whether I didn't receive that, that, detailed, that detailed document. And did you ask for this report to be done? I, again, I can't recall. I, th no, this is, this is an internal uh, Fujitsu document, and it, it doesn't. Um, I don't think it it sort of uh, points to post office specifically having having asked for it. On the other hand, I would have expected Mark to want this level of detail in explanation about what caused the incident. Yeah. And this was what was sent to you. Um, I, I, don't, I, I, I can't, I can't, I can't confirm or otherwise whether I received um, At the time, did you understand this report to have been taken, undertaken by independent experts or um, Fujitsu employees? Well, as I, say, I can't recall the document, so... <laughs> <laughs> um, and if we scroll down, um, we can see... Um, as you've already said, the background to this paper um, and the reason why it was written. Um, and it's to do with the Derby issue, which you've described, which is to do with transactions and banking transactions. Um, did you consider this to be a serious problem at the time? Um, so I was aware of the, the, the incident. Yes, it was a serious, it was a serious incident and it was taken very seriously at the time. Was um, it? Sorry, go on. You finish. I mean, I think I think um, having read this report, I mean, I, I think if I've I've understood it, and I've had no one to to bounce my understanding uh, off, and usually my process in looking at technical issues was was to bounce it off people so I interpret it correctly. But uh, under Legacy Horizon, when you used fast cap, fast cash. You also pressed settle, 
with Horizon Online, both those keys were still available, but you only, in, in this example, had the, 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 the person operating the, this transaction should have only pressed fast cash. They pressed settle, which shouldn't have been active and was active. This would, have, this would have caused me to ask questions about the approach to negative testing. Because where you take something where the process was press both, and you change it to where you only press one, but the other key is still there, you, you, you would have, I mean, negative testing is a very difficult area because you know, you, you, you've got to sort of um, work through all the, the combination of things that people might throw at the system that you wouldn't expect in the normal course of things to, to, to hit it. But, but that's, when I read this, that, that appeared to me to be pretty fundamental that such an obvious test had been, had been missed. And I think this document, or a document related to it, in, in fairness to Fujitsu, it does actually record that. It, it does ask the question about whether um, whether the approach to negative testing um, was, a, was as it ought to be. Um, at this time, uh, do you remember whether the post office was stressing to Fujitsu the importance of data integrity so that postmasters could be prosecuted? Was that something that would have been communicated? Um, I, don't, I, don't think that, um, I, I don't think that necessarily would have been top of mind at all, certainly not in the, in the programme team. Rather, just data integrity. It, it was just about data integrity. Just about getting the system right. Um, there is another version of this report. If we could turn up FUJ um, 00093031, and I appreciate you say you haven't, you don't remember receiving this report, mm, so mm. you you don't know the um, the way in which it played in your mind. But I'll take you to one paragraph. Um, so you can see there the date is the 9th of February. Um, my understanding from the documents is that you weren't sent this. Um, and if we scroll down, bottom paragraph. So this, this doesn't appear in the later version that was sent on um, to the post office, but it says the net effect would be that the post office and the branch records would not match. Where this happens, the post office investigates the branch and postmaster with a view to retraining or even uncovering fraud. It would seriously undermine post office credibility and possibly historic cases if it could be shown that a discrepancy could be caused by a system error rather than a postmaster slash clerk action. Um, most importantly, the central database is the system of record would be called into question. Um, does it surprise you to see that, that comment there in that report? I think in the circumstances of the, the fault that arose, it, you couldn't disagree with that statement. Okay, I so mean, it, it shows an understanding, I think, in Fujitsu of, um, of, of, of the relevance to, of data integrity to actions taken against the postmasters. But it's t totally appropriate because you've got um, you, you've got duplicate baskets being settled. Um, thank you. Um, Chair, I, I believe we initially discussed taking an early lunch now. This might be a convenient moment if we're to stop at 12.30. Oh, Chair, you're on mute again. That's fine. And if we um, have our usual hour, that still gives us sufficient time this afternoon? Yes. I won't be Fine. very long at all. Fine. And yes, that's what we'll do. We'll break now until 1.30. Thank you.